Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Caught in the Crossfire, the Business Impact of Cyber War and High-Tech Espionage, featuring Shane Harris. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm very excited to be part of this presentation today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, you want to make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is being presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try by refreshing your browser. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console and covers most technical questions. If you have a question during the presentation for our presenter, please click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. question. At the end of the presentation, Ken Weston, Tripwire Security Analyst, will be leading a Q&A session with, with Shane Harris. I will be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides. Also, you may earn a CPE credit for attending today. And lastly, the first 50 attendees of the webcast today will be receiving a digital copy of Shane Harris's book. So look for an email about that in the next week. Now let's get on with the presentation. Our featured presenter today is Shane Harris. Shane Harris is an author and journalist who has written extensively about intelligence and national security. His new book, At War, The Rise of the Military Internet Complex, explores the front lines of America's new cyber war. Shane is currently a senior correspondent at the Daily Beast, where he covers national security, intelligence, and cybersecurity. He's been, uh, his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Slate, TheAtlantic.com, National Journal, The Washington Post, and the U.S. Naval Institute's Proceedings. And now we're excited to have him present for us today at Tripwire. So now, now without further delay, I'll turn it over to Shane Harris. Take it away, Shane. Hi, thanks, Kate, and thanks everyone for joining us today, uh, and thanks to Tripwire <clears throat> for putting this conversation uh, together. I'm really excited to be talking to all of you. Uh, sorry I can't see all your faces, but thank you for being here and for giving me some of your time this afternoon. Uh, I was really pleased that, that Tripwire asked me to do this talk in particular with a focus on uh, how businesses are, as we say, being caught in the crossfire of, of cyber war and high-tech espionage. And we're, we're going to talk a lot about that uh, today. I imagine if you're tuning into this webcast, you, you probably already have a burning interest in this, and perhaps you've already been caught in the crossfire yourself. Um, but I think this is a really important topic to explore. And also, uh, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about in this presentation how companies really, in addition to sort of being caught in the crossfire, are at the same time integral uh, to producing a national cybersecurity strategy. And I'm going to talk some as well about what exactly that is and how did we arrive at the point where we have a, a, an emerging security strategy. So <clears throat> just briefly about me, I mean, Kate introduced me in my bio. I've been writing about intelligence issues and technology and really where the two of those intersect. Uh, really since 9-11. I was actually a technology reporter just starting out in my career on 9-11, uh, writing about technology in the federal government. And that's really when that space became sort of lit up uh, by challenges faced by information sharing, intelligence sharing, cybersecurity. The tech beat really kind of became an intel and a security beat. And so I've been pursuing these kinds of stories for many, many years, and, and ultimately this culminated in the book that we're going to be talking about today, At War. Um, so to kind of give you a frame setting here, um, cybersecurity is certainly probably top of mind for a lot of people on this webcast. What, what is not always appreciated is the extent to which it is now a leading, dominating, really, national security issue for officials in Washington. And let me just give you some, some quotes here that will kind of set the scene for how it is exactly that our top national security officials 
are framing the problem of cyber threats to include cyber espionage, cyber crime, and also sort of in the most severe category, uh, potential cyber attacks on critical physical infrastructure that are increasingly connected to the Internet. So the director of the National Security Agency, Admiral Mike Rogers, who is the, the man you see sitting there before you in the glasses testifying before Congress, uh, recently gave testimony where he said in his words that the risk of a massive cyber attack in the United States was, quote, not theoretical. He's actually said subsequently that he believes that in his tenure in office, uh, he will see or we will see a major cyber attack on the United States, uh, possibly something at the, aimed at the banking system or a critical infrastructure. Uh, Rogers told Congress that hacking attacks on U.S. networks were, in his words, literally costing us hundreds of billions of dollars and would have a, quote, truly significant, almost catastrophic failure if we don't take action. And he is really describing the gamut from cyber fraud, cyber espionage aimed at U.S. companies that, of course, is costing them billions of dollars in lost business, in lost trade secrets, but also the threat of a major catastrophic attack. So this has been really sort of a, the, the, the leading issue that Admiral Rogers, since he took over the NSA, has uh, put on his agenda. And he's joined by a lot of his other colleagues in the intelligence community. Every year, the intelligence community puts out what's called the Global Threats List that they present publicly into Congress, where they're taking stocks of the big national security issues on the horizon, or really facing us right now, too, that threaten American national security. Climate change has been on that list. Terrorism has been on that list. ISIS has been on that list. Cybersecurity, cyber threats have actually topped the list or been near the top for the fast past three years. So the intelligence community as a whole is speaking with one voice saying this is a top of mind issue. And add to that uh, the FBI director, the new FBI director, James Comey, uh, who has said publicly that the risk of cyber attacks and a risk in cyber related crime to include espionage and also financial fraud is going to be the most significant national security threat over the next decade. And I think it's an extremely powerful statement coming from the director of the FBI, which is an organization that for the past decade, of course, has seen terrorism from groups like Al-Qaeda and physical attacks in the United States as the biggest national security threat. So it's fair to say that in Washington right now, cyber is beginning to trump terrorism in terms of what officials are most worried about and most focused on trying to stop. So how did we get to this point where these kinds of attacks from remote operators that we cannot actually see became sort of a leading edge kind of issue that is keeping Washington up at night? Well, there are a couple of stories that I tell in the book, and I'll relate to you now, that I think really going to give you a sense of when it was that the upper reaches of the government and the national security establishment, and by extension, a lot of people in private industry really started to kind of wake up to these threats and realize that there was a need to address them. And the first story that I tell uh, takes place in the Oval Office in May 2007. Uh, George W. Bush, of course, was president, uh, and he gathered a, a number of his top-level national security advisors one day in the Oval Office for a meeting about the security of the Internet. And actually, it wasn't even Bush so much that called it as it was called for him uh, by his director of national intelligence at the time, a man named Mike McConnell, who used to run the NSA. McConnell was there. Henry Paulson, who you see there in the picture, uh, the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, then the Treasury Secretary was there, as well as the president's top security and counterterrorism advisors. And McConnell had actually been quite worried about the vulnerability of the Internet to, to hackers and to, to fraudsters for many, many years. In fact, in the mid-1990s when he ran the NSA, uh, he actually was the first director to start making cybersecurity an issue that he wanted to put on people's radar and also start employing cyber offensive techniques by the NSA, which of course is our agency that is responsible for breaking into foreign computer systems and stealing information to gather by, for U.S. policymakers. So McConnell knows that Bush is not the most technologically savvy of presidents, but that the threat of physical terrorism has always resonated with the commander-in-chief. And so he makes this very smart analogy to try and get Bush to focus on Internet security. He says, imagine, Mr. President, if on 9-11, Rather than hijackers taking over airplanes and crashing them into the World Trade Center, what you had was computer hackers sitting in another country accessing the systems of a major U.S. bank or perhaps a financial trading system, breaking into the databases, 
and either corrupting the information or even deleting information about accounts, transactions, timestamps, or the like, such that the information coursing through these networks that are so vital to the U.S. economy could not actually be trusted and people started losing confidence in it. He said very quickly, once this became known, you would see a financial panic and essentially things like a run on the banks, possibly banks closing, financial exchanges shutting down. And he said to Bush, the financial impact, the economic consequences of that cyber attack would be worse than the economic consequences of the physical attacks on 9-11, which of course we all remember the effect of that was to deepen an already very bad recession. And Bush is hearing this, and it's almost like something he's hearing for the first time that he can't quite believe, how it is that these remote actors could have such a devastating effect on the American economy. And so he turns to his Treasury Secretary, who we know used to be the CEO of Goldman Sachs, Henry Paulson, and he says, Hank, is what Mike is saying true? And Paulson and McConnell kind of share a look at each other, and Paulson looks back to the president and says, well, sir, not, as, not only is what he is saying true, but when I was the CEO of Goldman Sachs, this was the scenario that kept me up at night. This was the thing for which we had no defense, and we were not entirely sure how we would recover. And Bush, who is not one to be known for theatrics, actually in this meeting, as it's been described to me by several people who were there, pushes his chair back from the table, stands up, and says to this assembled room of national security officials, the internet is our strategic advantage and vital to our economy for the foreseeable generation. I will do whatever is necessary to protect it. In his words, Bush said, I will do another Manhattan project if I have to. And he turns to his director of national intelligence, Mike McConnell, and says, Mike, you brought this problem in here. You've got 30 days to fix it. So needless to say, they did not fix the Internet in 30 days. But this is sort of the moment that we, we, we talk in cybersecurity a lot about the idea of executive buy-in. This is the ultimate executive buy-in. This is the commander-in-chief realizing that there is a vulnerability in our national economy, essentially, in our way of life that exists in cyberspace, and he decides that he is going to do something about it. And the something that he did, which we will talk more about how that evolves as the talk goes on, <clears throat> was to essentially create a whole-of-government approach, focusing the resources of the military and the intelligence community and organizations like the Homeland Security Department on assessing where the vulnerabilities were in cyberspace, which of our infrastructures and our industries were most at risk, and trying to figure out a way to shore up those risks and to work with industry to do that. Now, to that point, there's a second story that happens right around the same time. This is a few months after the Oval Office meeting at the Pentagon uh, that I think really starts to get at how it is that the government is going to start approaching this problem and creating a system of national cyber defense. So this story involves uh, a, a secret room at the Pentagon, uh, a room that's often called a SCIF, or a S Secure Compartmented Information Facility. A SCIF is one of these rooms, if you watch Homeland or any spy movies, where every, before everyone goes into it, they have to put their cell phone outside and any recording equipment or electronic devices. It's essentially an eavesdropping-proof facility in which only the most sensitive and highly secured classified information is shared. So into this room come the CEOs of many of the country's leading defense contractors, companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, really marquee names that comprise the defense industrial base in this country, the people who build weapon systems, the people who are building tanks and airplanes and computer systems for the government. And they're given from military officials what they bill as a threat briefing and are shown classified information about how hackers believed to be operating in China have penetrated computer networks inside the United States and are making off with huge amounts of information about American weapon systems. Uh, one in particular that was of vital importance at the time and still is, something called the Joint Strike Fighter or the F-35, which is the most expensive weapon system the Pentagon has ever built and is supposed to be our next generation of fighter planes, really the fighter to end all fighters. Hackers were making info up with information about that, about the plane's avionics, about its guidance systems, information that could be used to defeat the plane in battle potentially or even try to build a replica of the plane itself. So these contractors are seeing that all this huge amount of classified information is, is, is leaking out to China, but then they're told something that is a bit of a twist on the story. The hackers did not get this information by going after the Pentagon's networks. They didn't get it by hacking into the Air Force. 
They got it by going after the contractors, by the companies represented by the people in that room. They had found that those cyber defenses on those networks were far weaker than they were on military networks, and that this really comprised sort of the soft underbelly of the defense industrial base in the United States. And so much like Bush looking at McConnell and saying, you brought this problem in here, you've got to fix it, military officials looked to these CEOs and said, we have a weak link in the security chain, it's you, and you need to help us fix this problem. And what they really settled on was a way of trying to start to begin to share information with companies about cyber threats, to share with corporations really the fruit of espionage, things that the government knew about what hackers in China and other countries were doing, and giving that to corporations so that they could defend their networks. And the momentousness of this arrangement I mean, should not be lost on us. This, is, this may actually be unprecedented in terms of information, classified information being given over at this level to companies. In fact, it was so legally difficult to do this to make sure that all the people who had the uh, who were receiving it had the proper security clearances that it took a year just for the lawyers to figure out how this would work but ultimately what this blossomed into was an information sharing arrangement or what often gets called a public private partnership whereby the government agrees to give some information to industry and in return expects industry to tell it what are you seeing on your networks what are you seeing in terms of the threats coming at you and to try and share information with each other it was fairly easy to do in the context of the defense industrial base because obviously these companies have a very powerful incentive to share information with government government is their largest client and I think the Pentagon made it very clear that they expected some cooperation from these companies if they wanted to continue doing business um, but this model really has begun to expand even beyond the defense industrial base. And there's a good reason for this. Um, as I probably don't have to tell you all, companies own 85% of what we would call U.S. cyberspace, which is to say, the, you know, as Ted Stevens was once derided for calling it, the series of tubes, the infrastructure that makes up what we know as the Internet. This is 85% owned privately by corporations and by individuals in some cases as well. So the government has realized that it has to partner with these companies if it is going to monitor cyberspace, if it is going to know what the threats are that are coming at us, and if it is going to get information to the people who can actually go out and build defenses that are going to protect information that's vital really to all of us or to key sectors of the economy. So this started taking off in 2007. This initial uh, arrangement just with the defense companies started with about a dozen corporations. It now includes more than 100 companies, and the Pentagon actually wants to extend this to about 200 companies as time goes on. Uh, the government has actually begun sharing cyber threat intelligence and signatures with Internet service providers in the hopes that they can program this information into their systems and start to filter for malware and other threats and ideally protect their customers downstream. Um, the Defense Department and the NSA in particular, the National Security Agency, has set up monitoring arrangements with some large technology companies. Uh, one that I read about in the book is Google, uh, which after Google in 2011 publicly announced that it had been uh, hacked by spies in China that stole some of its intellectual property, uh, entered into an agreement that is still classified with the National Security Agency to share some kind of cyber threat information. We still don't know precisely what, but this is ultimately something that is aimed at trying to facilitate the flow of information back and forth. Uh, the Pentagon certainly would like to know all of the threats that a company as large as Google is seeing. And I think from Google's perspective, they wouldn't mind having a heads up from the National Security Agency about when the bad guys are coming for them either. <clears throat> so defending in cyberspace and also to some extent attacking in it, we should remember as well, has become a major cooperative effort between the government and the intelligence community and its partners in the technology industry. Now, some of this is willing. Some of these people are compelled to participate in this arrangement. But by and large, this kind of back and forth is what I'm getting at when I talk about in my title of the book, the military internet complex. And I'm, I'm consciously hearkening back as well to the idea of the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower described. So I'll return to this theme as we go on, but it's important to keep in mind that this is what we're talking about is the sort of coming together of these two uh, large categories of government in the form of the military and the intelligence community with the high tech sector. So this arrangement really kind of begins in the Bush administration but where it really takes off and starts to kind of put meat on the bones is during the Obama administration, which, which practically from day one has made cybersecurity to include 
protecting the internet from spies, from criminals, and from foreign military organizations, a top priority. And, and this should not be too much of a surprise. I mean, President Obama, I think it's fair to say, is the first internet president. I mean, he comes into office having used the internet in a masterful way to organize, to identify who his campaign donors and supporters would be. But he also had a lot of experience with cybersecurity himself. In fact, he uh, learned uh, not far from inauguration that Chinese hackers had broken into his uh, campaigns, uh, cam uh, the email system for his presidential campaign. And they'd also penetrated John McCain's as well. So Obama had some firsthand experience with being spied on by foreign governments when he came in. Um, you know, of course, George Bush was not the most technologically savvy president, as we've said. You know, he once famously said that he used the Google to look at satellite images of his ranch in Texas. Uh, not to pick on George W. Bush, Bill Clinton also only sent one email during his entire time uh, in the White House. So Obama comes in with two predecessors who really are not of the Internet uh, and maybe don't have as much intimate familiarity with it. Obama doesn't have that challenge. He sort of gets this uh, from day one. And only five months after he is inaugurated, he gives this really powerful speech in May 2009 in the East Room of the White House where he is unveiling what his approach, his administration of his approach is going to be to cybersecurity. And he starts by saying something that actually sounds surprisingly a lot like what President Bush had said uh, in some of his private meetings. Obama says, quote, the vast majority of our critical information infrastructure in the United States is owned and operated by the private sector. We will collaborate with industry to find technology solutions that ensure our security and promote prosperity. And I think you just sort of think about that for a moment. This is the President of the United States standing up and talking about ensuring security and promoting prosperity and partnering with private industry to do that. Usually when we think about ideas of ensuring security and promoting prosperity, that is an inherently governmental function. I mean, these are things that in our founding documents, the government is, is, is empowered to do and, and really commanded to do on behalf of all of us. And here's the president saying that we are going to partner with industry to do that in this area of cyberspace because we cannot do it by ourselves. Uh, the president says that we are going to treat the internet, in his words, as, quote, a strategic national asset and protect it as such. He's talking about the internet the way we talk about land and, and air and sea. He's talking about it as something that is vital to the U.S. economy, to our way of life, and needs to be protected. And, and to go one further, Obama did something really extraordinary in this speech. He actually revealed publicly for the first time uh, in an open setting that hackers in foreign countries had penetrated the computer systems, the industrial control systems that control electrical power plants in the United States, uh, which was a very scary revelation. It was not an unknown idea to reporters and others who had been covering at the time, but no public official had ever come out publicly and said this, and certainly not the president. So he is saying the cyber threat isn't just theoretical, it is here, and we have to deal with this now, and we have to do it together. So Obama, like Bush before him, really, is describing cyberspace as, in many ways, a battlefield. Uh, and that is how the military and the intelligence community actually approach it today. They will often describe the Internet or cyberspace as the fifth domain of warfare, the fifth being after air, land, sea, and outer space. And importantly, the military and its partners in the intelligence community view being able to operate successfully and even dominate in that space as important as it is in the other four. Now, if you want to get a sense of sort of where the priorities right now in Washington are, it's always a good idea to follow the money. And the budget, every year when the budget comes out, it is a great opportunity for us to see where policymakers are sort of placing their priorities. And we can definitely see this when it comes to cybersecurity. So just taking the 2014 budget as an example, the U.S. government planned to spend more than $13 billion dollars on cyber defense programs. And that was mostly just to protect the government computers and networks and also to share intelligence with private industry, as I've been describing. With that in some comparison, in the same year, 2014, the government planned to spend $11.6 billion on direct efforts to combat climate change, which Obama had called the global threat of our time. So we're spending $13 billion on cyber defense programs. And this doesn't count the classified spending or the offensive spending, by the way, and 11.6 on direct efforts to combat climate change. I think that's a pretty powerful comparison and underscores where priorities are right now. Uh, another data point on this, the 2012 Pentagon budget 
had the word cyber in it 12 times. The 2014 Pentagon budget had the word cyber in it 147 times. Uh, so you can, you can just see how it is pervading the vocabulary of Washington and how cyber seems to be mentioned almost in, in every breath and every conversation about national security in the United States, even if it doesn't seem to have anything to do with cyber. Uh, in fact, the, the, the top cyber policy official for the Department of Defense gave a speech a couple of months ago where he joked that during the last budget cycle, he was seeing a lot of proposals come across his desk for things like the cyber tank or the cyber plane. Uh, and sort of underscoring the degree to which there's this perception in Washington that if you want to get funding for your program, just slap the word cyber on it and you'll get it. Uh, because cyber is the only part of the Defense Department budget that's growing. And while he was necessarily he was, he was tongue-in-cheek about this, there's a fundamental truth there, which is that this is the sort of the, the where all of the attention is focused <clears throat> and where the resources are going in the Defense Department. So the government is spending this huge amount of money on cyber defense, but I think there are two important questions that we have to ask here. Is the Internet any more secure because of it? And has this focus on cyber defense as a cooperative effort with industry clarified the role of each side, industry and government? I think to the first point, you probably have to say it's too soon to tell whether or not the investment has actually resulted in measurably better security. But to the second point, whether it's clarified the roles, I would say arguably it has not. And there's still a lot of disagreement about what the proper role of each side is, particularly when it comes to a moment of great crisis. And here I want to relate a story that I think really captures <clears throat> how it is that we still don't entirely know in this great information sharing partnership who is supposed to take the lead when something really bad happens. So this is a story from September of 2012. And you may remember it's been written about publicly, but there was a series of major denial of service attacks on the websites of U.S. banks. Um, by one estimate, uh, the flow of traffic aimed at these websites was several times larger than what Russia had directed at, a, at computers in Estonia in 2007 in a very visible cyber attack that actually ground most of the country's electronic infrastructure to a halt and at the time was regarded as one of the most devastating cyber attacks on record. In this case, in 2012, the bank's internet service providers reported that there was more traffic coming at the websites than they had ever seen directed at a single website. Uh, the attackers appeared to have hijacked whole data centers or clouds of thousands of computer servers. And it was almost rather as if than launching a few ships at a target, they were sending an armada. Um, <clears throat> there was real panic in Washington around the time this was happening. Um, I can even remember talking to sources who were having to cancel meetings saying that they were having to go to last uh, minute uh, meetings that had been called at the White House, and we didn't exactly know why, but later we understood what was happening. And the banks were panic about, panicking about this too. Um, it's important to emphasize these were not attacks that were aimed at the data centers of banks. They were not aimed at accounts. They were aimed only at the public facing portals, but this was a huge disruption to the business. And of course, it was traffic that they'd never seen before. Uh, more troubling was who these attacks were attributed to. Uh, it is now widely believed in the intelligence community that the government of Iran was behind these attacks. And that's troubling for a number of reasons. <laughs> we, are not we are obviously uh, not allies with Iran, uh, but also Iran up to this point in 2012, we understood them only to have sort of a notional or an aspirational kind of approach to building a cyber force. It was an ambition that the government had, but it was not entirely clear whether they had achieved any great strides in cyber offensive cyber operations, cyber war and disruption. Well, now we knew that they had. Uh, any group of hackers that was able to marshal this kind of force at a target had to be put in a category of being very, very skillful, and the Iranians were now there, and they had gotten to this level basically from zero to where they were in 2012 in a very short period of time, only about two or three years by most estimates. So executives decide that they're going to go to the government and ask them for help, and it was related to me by one individual who was in charge of cybersecurity policy at the Homeland Security Department at the time, he told me these, that, that bank executives and security personnel were coming to him saying, what are you going to do about this? And you being the federal government, what is the federal government going to do to put a stop to these attacks? And as he told me, he just had to look at them and sort of say, what do you expect us to do? There's nothing that we can do. And it was this very sort of powerful moment for him and I think for the executives and the banks as well, of this sort of sense of helplessness. A foreign government is launching an attack 
on major U.S. corporations. It's having real disruption. There's real reasons to fear that there is powerful momentum and skill behind this attack, and there's not really any clarity on who is supposed to step forward and try to stop it. And I think this underscores you know, a number of sort of weaknesses and deficiencies in our policy right now. It shows you that some of the problems the government was even having internally with sharing information and responsibility for a cyber attack. Was it the Homeland Security's job to respond to this? Arguably not. DHS doesn't really do operations. Was it the responsibility of the National Security Agency? Well, it's an intelligence agency that generally spies on foreign governments. Was it the military's responsibility? Well, this wasn't really an attack on a critical infrastructure. We weren't being invaded. Each one of these different constituents might argue that they did have some role to play in it, but clearly none of them believed that they were empowered to take action. And no one was really in charge of responding to an event like this. <clears throat> the big lesson here for these companies that were affected, and I think it's one that we have to keep in mind really for, for everyone in industry, is this. The government is not, by and large, coming to companies' rescue when they are under attack in cyberspace. If you're not a critical infrastructure, like the power grid, or like a bank data center, you're probably not going to get special attention from the government. And even if you are a critical infrastructure, we've seen that you're going to have to handle some of these events on your own. So companies, which are that essential link in the security paradigm that we're here developing, are in fact being caught in the middle by our policies. And they're actually being asked to do some very extraordinarily, I think, risky things uh, legally and for their reputations when it comes to cybersecurity as well. And, and here's one of the other, the, the ironies of the government not coming to companies' rescue is when the government has said that they want more authority over what companies are doing. Um, there's a great story that I relate in the bank from when, uh, sorry, in the book, from when Keith Alexander, who's the, the, the man you see looking very serious there in the picture before you now, was the director of the National Security Agency. Um, back in 2011, actually had a sit-down meeting in New York with uh, financial executives representing many of the largest banks uh, in the country. And it should be noted that the banks do a pretty good job sharing information themselves about the threats that they're seeing and the actors that are out there. And generally in the industry are seen to have a pretty good information sharing system in place. Well, Alexander sat down with them and, you know, this is sort of before even the denial of service attacks on the bank websites, which is even more interesting, says to them, look, we understand that your data centers are very valuable. It's a critical financial piece of financial infrastructure. And I'm concerned that you are not well protected. I'm concerned that there are evildoers out there that could try to be disrupting your business and causing massive economic damage. So the answer to this is I want you to allow the National Security Agency to install monitoring equipment on your networks. Let us use the power of the NSA to come into your networks and help you fend off from hackers. And as described to me by people who were in that meeting, they sort of looked at Alexander uh, astonished and, and maybe even appalled, I think it's fair to say. Um, Certainly, these companies were open to the idea of sharing information, of the government giving them intelligence that they could use, and maybe even of sharing information with the government and with each other. But the idea that now an intelligence agency wanted to come in and physically sit on its networks just seemed like a bridge too far. And I think this was sort of a clarifying moment where you started to see industry pushing back as well against government and saying, in this partnership that you want to forge, there are simply going to be some things that we cannot do. I mean, for the banks, one, there was the question of, do you really want to let the nation's largest in intelligence agency, a spying organization, sit on your networks? What was going to happen if they found uh, uh, other information that might be useful to them? What, what, how, do, how do we know that the government coming into our networks isn't going to lead uh, down a slippery slope of gathering information for other purposes or for regulatory purposes? So there was sort of a public and a liability and a legal question here as well. And frankly, even a legal question of whether you can allow a government to knowingly install surveillance equipment, which is what this is, on your networks. So that meeting did not go anywhere, but it did really sort of start to clarify how far it was that companies were going to be willing to go. Now, fast forwarding to more recent events, there's another incident that I think that we've all been reading a lot about, I'm sure, no doubt, that I think sort of adds yet another kind of complicating wrinkle 
what this relationship is going to be between government and industry. And that's the attack by North Korea on Sony Pictures Entertainment uh, back in November and December of last year. Um, <clears throat> it's worth noting that, and I should say at the outset, I am persuaded that North Korea uh, directed and organized uh, this attack. I know there was some controversy around that in the beginning based on the information the government was putting out about it, but I'm persuaded that they are the guilty party here. What's interesting about that event is that inside the White House, attributing the attack to North Korea was really the easy part. And that's worth noting for a second uh, what an extraordinary development that is. I mean, we hear obviously in cybersecurity that there's this issue of the attribution problem. How can you formulate a response to an attack when you don't know for sure where the attack is coming from? How could you legally respond to an attack when you don't know who the actor is? And attribution is still a challenge, but inside the U.S. government, and particularly within the National Security Agency, it is far less of a hurdle than it has been in recent years. The NSA actually knew that North Korea was behind the Sony attack because the NSA was in North Korea's networks and they could see that they were behind this attack. In fact, one intelligence official I talked to recently said, you know, look, we were very aware of many different attempted intrusions coming from North Korea directed at U.S. businesses, but that's not why we are in North Korea's networks. We're there trying to monitor its nuclear weapons program. We're there trying to find out information about Kim Jong-un, uh, the leader of North Korea. It's not really our role to be alerting every single company that it is possibly the victim of a spear phishing campaign from North Korea. Now, it may be in the future, but at the time, this was not something they were prepared to do. So it wasn't attributing the attack that was hard. It was deciding what to publicly do in response to that attack that was hard. And within the Situation Room and in the White House, the President and his advisors were having conversations about if we go public with the information that we know it's North Korea, that is going to set precedent and it's going to start creating policy. If we come out and publicly blame a foreign government, which we have never done before, we're going to be expected to take some kind of action and some kind of response. And to then, not only that, but then to frame it in a legitimate and potentially legal context. Um, so two things happened. One is that the public side that we know is President Obama came out in December, December 19th of last year, blamed North Korea publicly for the attack, and announced that we would engage in a proportional response, his word, to the attack from North Korea. Well, proportional is drawing actually from the international humanitarian law, or the law of war and law of armed conflict. It's essentially saying that we are going to do something to another country that is equal to the damage or the harm that you caused to us. And publicly what we know is that largely involved sanctions, sanctions against particular actors in North Korea to try and uh, cut them off from the global economy. I don't know how much good that does. North Korea is already the most sanctioned country in the world practically, but it was nevertheless sort of a, a, a show of political or economic force against North Korea. Um, clandestinely, the National Security Agency did launch, according to my sources, uh, directed cyber attacks at key parts of the North Korean internet infrastructure. Uh, and also at key government websites and installations. Uh, we did not cause the Internet to crash, my sources tell me, but nevertheless there was also a cyber response meant to send a message to North Korea. And you know that all sounds sort of legitimate on its face. I think it is. It certainly seems proportional uh, given what happened and the, the harm suffered by Sony, which included uh, uh, information that was lost, included incredible blows to its reputation. There was a threat against moviegoers going to see the, the, the film, the interview that North Korea was so worked up about. But now we're in the realm of setting policy. The United States government publicly responds and forcefully responds to an attack on a private industry, on a private company. And this has raised many questions to which we still don't have great answers about what does that mean going forward. When there is another big attack on a major U.S. corporation, is the government going to come out and take some kind of steps? Is the government going to come out and consistent with its policy in the North Korea case, actually go after another government? Uh, my initial answer is it's going to depend on who the government is. Uh, for a lot of companies, and maybe some of those you are on this call, um, the idea that foreign governments are hacking into U.S. computer systems and stealing information will come as no great surprise. Maybe you've had your own run-in uh, with hackers that are believed to be in China. Maybe you've seen intellectual property from your company stolen. And it will be no news to you that the President has never stood up and given a speech in the White House and said we're going to sanction China because of that activity. 
North Korea is essentially an easy target. There are very few consequences for responding to North Korea. The harder problem going forward here is what the administration, any administration, is going to do to respond to threats and to real attacks against companies that come from countries that we don't want to antagonize. Countries like China, countries like Russia, maybe even countries like Iran, where we're, of course, we're engaged in a very complicated and delicate relationship uh, that's playing out right now over their nuclear program. So we're setting policy on the one hand, but it's not entirely clear that that policy is going to be consistent. And this is something that I think that companies need to keep in mind, again, as they're going forward. It's this theme of the government is not necessarily coming to your rescue. And I don't think that all companies can anticipate that they're going to get the same kind of response that Sony saw uh, with that attack on North Korea. So to kind of bring this all together now, um, what we've covered is that we know that companies are by and large the targets in the cyberspace. They own 85% of the infrastructure. They are subject to attacks. They are subject to penetration, espionage, sabotage. We know that the government both needs their assistance and cooperation, but isn't going to come to their rescue. Now, there is legislation pending before Congress right now that will start to help, I think, to clarify some of these issues here. But we're at a bit of a standoff there, too. Uh, I'm not entirely confident the legislation is going to pass, but even if it does, we are just at the beginning of an era of national cyber defense. We are just starting to grapple with the severity of these issues, with how we're going to share information. We're witnessing a coming together of industry and government that I think is very much like how President Eisenhower described the military-industrial conflict complex in his farewell speech when he called it something, quote, new in the American experience. I think that this coming together of these two sides and all of the conflicts and the policy dilemmas and the inconsistencies that arise in the military internet complex are also something that is new in the American experience and heralds a very exciting but also very scary and confusing future. So cyberspace, if we want to try and just take one look at it, <laughs> I argue in the book is, is too vast and too pervasive and too important to how we live to allow a single entity to govern it or to dictate the norms of behavior. And I argue that this authority certainly shouldn't be vested inside an intelligence agency as it has been for much of this debate. It should not be the NSA or should not be the Defense Department trying to set the rules for this. This has to be a collaborative effort. And that is going to require more and more companies asserting their role in that and demanding to have a seat at the table and how these policies are crafted. There's no neat way of defining cyberspace. It is not a commons, but it is also not private. Uh, we've come to depend upon it as a public utility, like electricity and like water, but it's still, at the end of the day, mostly a collection of privately owned devices. But I think that cyberspace undeniably is a collective, and that's why it's incumbent upon everyone who touches it, all of us, all of you on this call, to take a stake in how we treat it and define what President Eisenhower called in that farewell speech, quote, essential agreement on issues of great moment, the wise resolution of which will better shape the future of the nation. So with that, I will thank you for your attention, and I'm going to turn it over now to Ken, and we will uh, start a Q&A, and I look forward to uh, hearing your questions about this topic and about any others that you'd like to discuss. Thanks, Shane. Uh, so yeah, this is Ken Weston. I'm a security analyst here at Tripwire. Uh, I wanted to uh, just uh, do a quick reminder that there's a Q&A widget. Uh, so if you do have a question for Shane, I'd like to ask you to go ahead and submit it through that uh, Q&A widget, and uh, we'll see if he can answer it for you. Um, first, I, I wanted to thank Shane again for uh, joining us for this webcast. I'm particularly ecstatic <laughs> because I found uh, his latest book, At War, uh, to do a really excellent job of framing um, and providing rich context around the current political landscape with regards to cybersecurity. Uh, what really struck out to me has been the fact that when it uh, comes to securing our nation's networks and systems, uh, business in many respects are stuck in the middle, uh, where they're held uh, re responsible for securing their networks while also protecting their customers' privacy, which cyber war and high-tech espionage further puts at risk. Which leads me to my first question. Uh, today, in the U.S. House Intelligence Committee, they passed the Protecting Cyber uh, Networks Act, which will be moving to a full vote by the House of Representatives 
to by the end of April. Um, it's very similar to the Senate Cyber uh, Security Information Sharing Act, which was passed by the Senate Intelligence Committee recently. Uh, one of our own representatives here in Oregon, Senator Ron Wyden, was um, the only one to actually vote against the Senate bill, um, stating that it will have a limited impact on U.S. cybersecurity. Uh, what do you see as the key differences between these two bills, if any, and what do you see as the benefit and risk of this leg legislation to both businesses and the potential privacy implications for their customers? Sure, yeah, it's a, <clears throat> it's a great question. And, uh, you know, in, in the legislation, uh, as I alluded to in my, in my talk, that is sort of the, is a kind of the next big step in the evolution of this um, partnership. Essentially what these bills are trying to do is clarify what the roles and responsibilities are of companies to share information with the government. And there's already information sharing going on, but this is trying to take it to a much more sort of, you know, system-wide kind of level. The Senate bill that, that went through first, before the House bill that went today, um, had a number of issues related to uh, the sharing of personal and private information that privacy advocates and civil libertarians in particular were very concerned about. The bill on its face seemed to be largely aimed at sharing cybersecurity threat information, by which we would mean information about hackers and viruses and the like, but was believed to have far too many loopholes in it, uh, many activists thought, that could have allowed the government to essentially use this bill to gather information about all kinds of other threats. So there was a sense that the, that the cybersecurity bill was sort of actually masquerading for a cyber surveillance bill, as something much more pervasive. Uh, and, and I think no surprise that Senator Wyden, who's been really one of the most uh, consistently aggressive watchdogs, of surveillance issues didn't vote for it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the Senate committee put a number of amendments onto that bill. There were 12 of them all together. Uh, activist groups are still not entirely satisfied that it has enough protections, and particularly personal and consumer protections in it, but it's bringing it a lot closer to alignment, I think, with the House bill. Um, you know, it's important to remember that even House lawmakers today, in this, today since this bill has been passed, are warning that, it is, that we're not necessarily going to come to a final bill that satisfies all parties. Um, I think for businesses, what this ultimately comes down to is just two things. One, there is a need clearly expressed from their point of view that there have to be very clear rules and protections as well in place for when they share information with the government. Um, they need to know that they are not going to be held liable for sharing information, potentially even about their customers, and can't come back and be sued by them if they're going to cooperate with the government. But there's a second and potentially even you know, thornier issue that can't necessarily be resolved by the law, and that's really more one that has to do with perception. Um, if you are a company that, is, that has information that is of cybersecurity value, what if you don't want to share it with the government? What if you decide that actually you're prepared to do this on your own and it is more of a business risk for you and a perception and a reputational risk to share that information with the government? You might decide not to. And importantly, both of these bills make cybersecurity sharing voluntary. It does, it's not something that companies are going to be compelled to have to do. So I think that even if this bill passes, what's going to have to happen next is, is that the government's going to have to do uh, something of a, you know, maybe even of a PR campaign, frankly, to try and encourage companies to cooperate with it and give them assurances about how it's actually using the information. Because I'm not, I'm not persuaded that a lot of companies are going to voluntarily raise their hand and give over this information if they perceive that it could be do reputational harm to them or if they're not getting information back from the government in return. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, you mentioned China quite a bit. Um, you know, China recently announced the existence of their offensive security divisions, um, something you know many of us had, had already assumed were <laughs> were there. Um, and the U.S. also announced the establishment of new uh, intelligence divisions focused on cyber threats. Um, what's the what do you think is the purpose of publicly announcing this? Is it posturing, or is there something else that's going on? I think there's a little bit of posturing, <clears throat> but really what's happening I think here too is to some degree is, is, is a kind of an evolution in, in national security statecraft you know, that we've seen before. I mean, there's, uh, there's, there's the joke in Dr. Strangelove about how if you don't announce that you have the doomsday weapon, it can't be a deterrence. I think to some degree countries are becoming more and more open about their cyber capabilities because they do want to advertise to their adversaries that they have these capabilities and that they are prepared to use them. I mean, certainly from our perspective in the United States, we are probably, our companies are certainly 
under attack every day. We probably have the most to lose of any country in terms of our internet, internet economy our physical infrastructure in cyberspace. Um, we have not have done a great job about defense, and so I think there's a motivation to start trying deterrence, to try and signal to other countries, look, we have the capability. Yes, we are vulnerable, but we also have a tremendous offensive capability. I think, frankly, the president's statements on North Korea were aimed at that. It was not just so much a message to North Korea alone as to other countries, too, saying there will be consequences for countries that attack us. For the Chinese, which came out recently, as you said, in a, in, a, in a big military document and finally formally announced that they have this, I think it's the same idea, and I think it's also, uh, to some degree, wanting to have you know, a measure of respect and say we're going to kind of put our cards on the table and we want it to be known that we are acknowledging that we are in a uh, community of nations that is a fairly small group that has these kinds of very highly advanced offensive capabilities. The Russians are in that group, uh, the French and the Israelis as well. So I think that you know this is kind of a, an evolution that we've seen in the context of other uh, uh, stages of um, uh, military strategy, announcing that you have a weapon, announcing that you have a capability, both to gain respect and to some degree to create uh, a culture of deterrence. And uh, I have a question here from uh, an attendee. Uh, so during the Soviet area, a lot of technical data was stolen from the U.S. However, there were challenges with their ability to operationalize it. Um, do you, uh, what, is the, what does it look like today with Russia? Are they um, able to compromise technical data, um, and are they putting it to use? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, this actually applies to the Chinese as well. Um, <clears throat> to what extent are they taking this information about our weapon systems and, and using it to either replicate those systems or to try and foil them? Uh, on the side of replicating them, I think we, 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 we see that it's probably not so much that. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a, a fighter plane that was recently unveiled in China that does look suspiciously like the Joint Strike Fighter, um, but I haven't heard anybody say that it has all the same kind of sophisticated avionics on board um, that ours does, and they did not necessarily make off with the entire store of information on it. So I think that, like in the nuclear context, there is a challenge here that other countries that don't have the same kind of technological base that we do, that just because they steal the plants or something doesn't necessarily mean that they can build it. But what it does give them is tremendous economic advantage uh, and potentially um, in insight into uh, our strategy and our planning. So to take Russia, for instance, I think the Russians are, are keenly interested in not just what our government is thinking, but also what our energy companies are thinking, where they are planning to uh, drill for new resources of gas, where oil companies are trying to go, armed with that kind of economic information that could really give Russian companies a leg up. The Chinese especially are also interested in where we are trying to set trade policy, uh, what our, you know, our energy ambitions are. They've just entered into a new climate pact with us as well, so they're keenly interested in that. I think there's a lot more than just sort of weapons technology that cyber spies are trying to get. And from an intelligence gathering standpoint, I mean, the Internet is just a gold mine, right? I mean, cyberspace allows you to run operations against countries and against companies that in a previous generation you would have had to physically send spies or recruit agents to do. Uh, it, I mean, it allows company, countries to sit back and throw hundreds if not thousands of people at an operation and to never leave uh, a keyboard to do it. Um, it, it's almost, I mean, from the Chinese perspective in particular, it's like almost any information is useful information. They're, they're, they're just comprehensive about it. So I think it's more about gaining insight than it is to necessarily gaining uh, the, the blueprints for how to build something. Um, and this question is from Alex. Um, it's a pretty good one. Uh, do any cloud providers such as Amazon, um, do they have systems in place or policies uh, for detecting uh, when maybe their systems are being utilized, their infrastructure is being utilized for cyber warfare? One certainly hopes. <laughs> uh, I think companies have had to invest a lot more uh, in, in this space and in cloud providers in particular, you know, I go back to the attack on the bank websites in 2012 uh, where, where, where cloud systems were believed to have been compromised. You know, Amazon actually, and, it, and Amazon Web Services, this is a great example of, of, of one that has a very powerful incentive to do that. Amazon actually is building the cloud for the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, and would very much like to get into the business of building big, secure government cloud systems. Um, I think it's definitely going to be the case that these, these companies are going to have to figure out how to install constant monitoring equipment. And I would expect companies, frankly, that are already in that space 
to be further ahead of the game than perhaps, you know, let's take a large retailer like Home Depot or like Target. Uh, you know, I think um, a lot of people were probably surprised uh, by the fact that um, uh, companies of that size and scale were hacked in the way they are and millions of their customer information was stolen. Um, but we have to remember, too, that these are, these are brick-and-mortar companies, really. This is not necessarily the case that they are fluent in all of the, the demands of cybersecurity. I would expect cloud companies to sort of already have a leg up on that. Great. Uh, and this question is from Cheryl. Uh, so the U.S. government doesn't want U.S. companies to, you know, hack back. Um, you know, where is the line between cyber maneuvering and countermeasure and attacks? And what do you think companies should be able to do to, to defend their own network? That is such a great question, and it's actually one of the, uh, the more hot-button debates right now uh, in Washington and in the whole cybersecurity community writ large. So hacking back is illegal, <laughs> technically. Um, although I interviewed a former uh, intelligence official for the book uh, who said hacking back is illegal. It is happening today. Uh, I know companies that are doing it. I'm not going to say what they are, his words. Uh, and he said, and when they're doing it, they're being advised by some very good lawyers. Now, what that tells you is that I think that there are companies out there that have figured out that there are sort of gray areas through which they can maneuver. One of them being that if you're going to actually hack back or try and steal back information that was taken from you, you are not going to launch that operation from within the United States. You're going to hire somebody in Eastern Europe probably to do it uh, or perhaps in Asia to, to conduct that operation, and you're certainly not going to advertise it. Um, <clears throat> so all of this is not to say that the government is trying to completely stop companies from hacking back. I mean, clearly they, they know what's going on to some degree. The question is, where do you sort of draw the lines between what I think is inarguably a legitimate right to self-defense? I mean, we all have a right to self-defense in our homes. I don't know why it doesn't have to, why it couldn't extend to cyberspace. But also then how you keep private organizations, companies, from getting into cyber battles potentially with nation state actors. And so this is, you know, kind of I think one of the next big challenges that policymakers are going to have to deal with once they kind of get over the first hurdle with this law is, you know, if the government is not coming to your rescue, if the government's not going to go get the information back for you, if the government is not going to try and knock offline the people that are flooding you in a denial of service attack, how can we expect to really secure cyberspace then unless you allow private actors to take some authority for defending themselves? One of the proposals that's been floated uh, by people in the academic community, this is really interesting, is could we sort of use a model of counter piracy? Uh, back in the days when pirates were roaming the seas, you know, sovereign governments would give what were called letters of mark uh, to sailors to go out and act as sort of like a deputy on behalf of the government and go out and take down pirates. There are people who think that we might be able to do that in cyberspace as well. Um, from the government's perspective, it's going to have to be highly controlled. But I think that there is a realization, particularly among very sophisticated senior intelligence and national security officials, that you're going to have to allow companies to some degree to actively take over the role of defense and to go out and do more than just sit and wait for the bad guys to get them and to try to build stronger defenses, that we're going to have to start to accommodate some kind of more uh, um, proactive uh, defense, if you want to call it that. Great. And I have a, a lot of questions, actually, about how you're protecting yourself. Um, and, you know, right now, um, you know, particularly in your field and some of your sources uh, can be very sensitive. So, you know, how are you securing um, your sources, your information? Um, what's been the impact, uh, you know, of the book? Um, have, have you been, have you felt that you're at risk of um, additional surveillance or, or what, is, what are some of the challenges that you've had when you're writing the book as, as well as after? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I use uh, <clears throat> encrypted email uh, with many sources and colleagues, uh, encrypted text, uh, uh, encrypted voice communications when possible, although that's, that's tougher. Um, I use a password locker, which a lot of people are doing now to um, randomly generate and store my passwords in an encrypted space so that they can't be uh, easily guessed. Um, in general, though, I just try to be sort of consciously aware at all times of what I'm doing online, not just where I'm going, I'm uh, making sure that I'm going to secure sites and those kinds of things, but particularly with sources, um, frankly, just not really relying on email very much. Uh, it, it is definitely the case that 
Um, this administration has been much more aggressive in pursuing people who talk to journalists and disclose uh, information unauthorized. Uh, so I think there's a real responsibility on my part to make sure that the people that I'm talking to um, certainly understand what those risks are. Uh, I think one reason they've been aggressively pursuing so many prosecutions is because there are just more and more electronic trails of who's talking to who. It makes it extremely difficult, uh, you know, I, I'm not going <laughs> uh, to lie, to maintain contact with sources and to have sensitive conversations. Uh, but, you know, in journalism, I think face-to-face -face and voice communication is generally better, so that makes it good to talk on the phone. Uh, even there, obviously, you have to be um, very careful about where you're calling people and where they're located at the time. Um, but, you know, certainly writing about the, this topic for many years has, I think, made me you know, more keenly aware of the threats and, and kind of given me a motivation uh, to do something about it. Um, but it's hard. I mean, anyone who has tried to secure your own data and, you know, and, and, and had to deal with the myriad tools that are out there to do that knows that it's, it's, it's not just as simple as putting a lock on your front door and installing a, uh, you know, an alarm system. Uh, you have to be very active and constantly monitoring it. Um, I don't pretend that I have a perfect solution to this. I mean, I, I take heart that you know, very sophisticated companies that spend a lot of money on this stuff are still not able to completely defend themselves. But uh, you know, I'm doing what I can, and certainly in my profession, uh, I put you know, the protection of my sources first and foremost. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this uh, presentation. I'm, we have a, a lot of other questions. Um, I'm sure we could be here for several more hours. Um, we'll, uh, we'll actually uh, have you with us at RSA. So uh, folks, if you are going to be at RSA, uh, please join us at our booth, uh, 3301 on the 21st of next month. And uh, we'll even have uh, some uh, free books there. Uh, we'll have a book signing with Shane. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Kate. Great. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Yes, and thank you so much, Shane, for your interesting and informative presentation. It was fantastic. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast and to the slides. You may reply to that email if you'd like to earn a CPE credit for attending the webcast today. And as I also mentioned, the first 50 attendees of today's webcast will receive an email with information about receiving your free digital copy of Shane's book. We hope you'll join us on future webcasts, so check out tripwire.com, and also check out our award-winning blog, State of Security. Thank you, and have a great day.